Balkan, uh, Associate Professor Teresa Margit Lacaz. Um, it's a pleasure to have her in our uh, seminar series. I'm not quite sure where to start. I mean, maybe first the formalities that Margaret is Associate Professor uh, in philosophy here. And one of the things I always find amazing is that she is in a very different discipline and we do so many things uh, in similar ways, you know, on sort of philosophy. She works particularly on European philosophy and feminist philosophy, but also on psychology and aesthetics, and it sort of shows the arbitrariness of discipline and mm. boundaries in the sense that we located in different disciplines with different traditions and conventions and institutional structures, but often have so much uh, in common. And uh, having her as uh, part of the visual politics program is absolutely fantastic. Uh, Margaret has co coordinated one of our pilot streams together with Ted Manicelli and Tom O'Regan uh, on sort of film aesthetics and, and ethics. And I think you'll be saying part of it yeah, about of it. the project here. Yeah. That's been a really fantastic uh, collaboration, mm -hmm. and I hope we can continue that in, in the next uh, few years. But in terms of uh, uh, Margaret's work, as I said, one of the things that's amazing is that she does very disciplinary work you know, uh, that overlaps with people in politics, with people in ethics, in, in the range of fields. And I just mentioned some of her books, um, um, Ethical Restoration After Communal Violence, Wonder and Generosity, the analytic imaginary, integrity, and the fragile self, and with, with absolutely top outlets, including Cornell University Press. And I think, from what I understand, you have Edinburgh University Press lined up for um, the volume that comes out of the, mm. the pilot mm. project. Um, now, we'll understand you have a bit half, about half an hour, right? And then we have plenty of opportunity to for informal discussions, and we'll have even for even more informal discussions to uh, St. Lucy's afterwards, where we will also be celebrating Federica, uh, Federica Casas' uh, PhD, who she just obtained about three days ago. So we can sort of combine more informal discussions with, with celebrations. But we'll start with Marguerite, and thanks so much for joining us. We will have an online presence as well, so you'll, you'll be podcast around the world. Uh, for a much bigger audience than we have in the room here. And, uh, yeah, thanks. thanks so much, Marguerite. Yeah, well, thanks, Roland, for inviting me. And Roland asked me to just talk a little bit about our part of the Visual Politics Project, so our know with um, Ted and Tom. And so uh, Ted organised um, two workshops, and so we had two workshops in Brisbane where we invited people nationally and internationally to come and present papers. And then we put a collection together based on some of those papers, but plus some specially commissioned essays as well and then we sent it off to Edinburgh University Press and they said thank you for sending us such an interesting proposal so they were very enthusiastic about it so that's really exciting and so they've accepted it um, and so it's for their series um, the Edinburgh Studies in Film and Intermediality and they actually suggested putting truth in the title which is kind of interesting because I hadn't really thought so much about truth but then when I went through our proposal, I realised that we were mentioning truth like a lot. So they just really picked out a theme that was kind of there, but we hadn't highlighted it as much. So I'm quite happy with that now. Yeah. And we thought there's a lot to say about that topic. And then just a brief um, look at the table of contents as it stands at the moment. And as you can see, it's really um, interdisciplinary, but it's divided up according to these themes of aesthetics, ethics, and politics. And so um, the paper that I've got in there is kind of part of the Visual Politics Project, but it's also part of this kind of intersecting project that I'm working on about the question of non-violent resistance. And so the paper that I'm going to give today is part of that project. And so I'm working on a whole series of films to um, think about those questions. I can put that up again maybe at the end. But um, I think what I'll do is move on to uh, my actual paper. Uh, so that's it. So filming the Chilean plebiscite, trauma and resistance in Pablo Lorraine's No. And this is kind of a short version of my paper, so there's a lot kind of outside it. So the Chilean film No from 2012 that presents a response to trauma that's oriented to ending the Pinochet civic military dictatorship that existed from 1973 to 1990 through the concept of happiness as a form of resistance. The film concerns the 1988 plebiscite on whether Pinochet should stay as the president for eight more years, the yes or see vote 
or hold democratic elections, the no vote. I focus on how the film represents the transformation of that experience of trauma under the dictatorship into the idea of happiness. So notice a fictionalised account of the television campaigns for the 1988 plebiscite and it plays with the historical drama genre by incorporating large portions of the archival footage. So around 30% of the film's um, two hour running time is the archival footage. So according to the film, the initial idea of the No campaign was to condemn the abuses of the dictatorship by showing images of torture and brutality and the resulting trauma and negative affects or emotions. However, this approach was altered and combined with much more positive material because of a determination to win the campaign. And the film No shows how a new narrative is created in that context. So that's Pablo Laval. So in the film, the No campaign, headed by René Saavedra, a creative director in advertising, deploys an idea expounded by Aristotle that happiness is an intrinsic value through the chorus of a catchy theme song, Chile, Joy is Coming, and thus the best concept to appeal to a traumatised nation and galvanise them in favour of change. As I'll explain, while they weren't directly inspired by Aristotle, at least I don't think so, mm -hmm. uh, at least not according to the film, the focus on joy, allegria, was used in the No campaign as the first step to happiness, felicidad, on the understanding that happiness is an intrinsic value. The resistant No campaign, shown in No, portrays a possible future happiness if the regime were to end through the portrayal of joyful happiness. The narrative of No follows René from his initial reluctance to direct the No television campaign to his enthusiastic and determined pursuit of its success and ends with his ambivalent return to his advertising agency to work with his boss, Lucio Guzman, who directed the Yes campaign. While the film has been criticised for oversimplifying events and leaving out the grassroots campaign to register and mobilise voters, my interest is in the narrative of the film's portrayal of the shift of attention from painful trauma to happiness as a form of resistance. I analyse how the concept of happiness is presented as essential to resistance in the film, and I show through the character of René, the advertising man behind the campaign, the connection between individual and collective transformation toward happiness in the future. Both individual and collective processes are aimed at developing effective agency. I want to examine through the film know how a focus on positive affect can at times be a way of constructing effective agency and resistance rather than a traumatic focus on remembering suffering. Here I focus on the philosophical ideas that drive the campaign and the movie. Director Pablo Luan describes the film as a strange balance between documentary and fiction. Gail Garcia Bernal, who plays the protagonist, Rene Saavedra, calls it a fable and claims it provides a thorough political analysis of the subject. Um, so it forms a kind of trilogy with Laurent's earlier films, Tony Monero and Postmortem, which portray life under Pinochet and the military coup itself, respectively, um, and it contrasts strongly with his more recent works such as Jackie and Neruda, both released in 2016. And I think he's got, um, he's got one more movie that's just come out and another movie in the pipeline as well. But those two other films are really, really interesting, but very uh, contrasting to you know, but are really worth seeing as well if you're kind of interested in this at all. So as a film and relation to trauma, No occupies an unusual position in narrating a period of transition. Lorraine originally made a much longer film, four and a half hours, which had much of the history of resistance in it, <coughs> but he cut it down to focus on the marketing side, which interested him. As films tend to do, a complex history is compressed into a short scene or single character. For example, Instead of showing all the focus groups that led to the positive approach of the No campaign, the creative team asked Renee's housekeeper and Nanny Carmen um, what she thinks, since she represents the kind of people they need to convince. Carmen is concerned about preserving her um, son's and daughter's employment aspirations and is afraid of change, so is likely to be a yes voter. 
The film further concentrates on the month of the political advertising campaign for the plebiscite that follows growing resistance against and international pressure on the dictatorship. The No and the Yes campaign have only 15 minutes of screen time each daily to persuade people to vote their way in the referendum. Although, of course, the government-sponsored Yes campaign has the rest of the airtime as well due to its control of television content. For the programs, Franja, the propaganda electoral or official space for electoral propaganda um, were shown late on weeknights, so 10.45 p.m. and at lunchtime, 11.45 a.m. on the weekends. And so I wanted to show you just a really short clip of the campaign so you could get um, a sense of it, particularly if you haven't seen the film or even if you had seen the film, you might want a reminder. Antes que nada, quisiera decirles que lo que van a ver a continuación está enmarcado dentro del actual contexto social. Después de todo, hoy, Chile piensa en su futuro. Um, that also, actually, the clip is great to give you a sense of the aesthetic of the film as well. So what happens, as we see in the film, is that instead of repeating the trauma in images, as is initially proposed, there's a turning away from them. Renee insists that the campaign and the programs must focus on positive experiences and on what life would be like without the dictatorship. This change is a pragmatic break in the remembrance of the atrocities in order to make way for a future in which they can be remembered properly. The Chilean referendum is complicated as there is no distance in time from the traumatic events. They're ongoing, so it's understandable that people want to register their suffering. A new narrative must be created to overcome trauma and transform affect from fear and powerlessness to joy and center on the future rather than the past. And that narrative has to influence more than half of the population. They might not need to feel happiness, but they do need to focus on the idea of a happy future through images of joyful experiences like dancing, picnics, or even a mime artist. So these experiences might not be culturally authentic, as critics in the film point out, but they're like fragments of a possible future happy life. By 1988, Pinochet had been in power since 1973. Chile hadn't had an election since Salvador Allende's 1970 election, and the opposition campaign had to register people to vote and convince them to vote no. While no can be seen as promoting the values of the advertising industry or as criticising modern society, I argue that the film shows how the campaign can only be successful by concentrating on the philosophical concept of happiness. When the creatives brainstorm ideas of the campaign at a retreat, they arrive at the concept of ha happiness by thinking of what couldn't be better, asking, what's happier than happiness? The slogan and catchy jingle used in the campaign after that discussion is Chile, joy is coming. The concept involves joy, delight, spring, calm after the storm, a party, anything associated with happiness. Renee's idea of happiness is that it's a universal political concept and so can't be argued against, and he presents it in advertising language. The no programs also discuss the abuse and mi misery, they just don't make them the focus of the 15 minutes. 
They include interviews with no voters as well, and following interviews with focus groups about the campaign comedy sketches. So I argue that the discourse of happiness is a discourse of resistance in this case. So here I briefly examine Aristotle's conception of happiness to show what's distinctive about it. Aristotle, in the Nicomachean Ethics, contends that something that's worth pursuing in itself is more complete and unqualified than what we pursue for the sake of something else. He concludes, Now such a thing is happiness, for this we choose always for itself and never for the sake of something else, but honour, pleasure, reason, and every excellence we choose indeed for themselves, for if nothing resulted from them, we would still choose each of them, but we choose them also for the sake of happiness, judging that through them we will be happy. Happiness, on the other hand, no one chooses for the sake of these, nor in general for anything other than itself. Aristotle also considers that happiness is self-sufficient, and so it's the end of action. The campaigner's brainstorming session follows a similar train of thought, although it isn't directly based on Aristotle's ideas. In the case of the No campaign, happiness is a form of active resistance to the negative emotions of fear and anxiety and the pressure to support the status quo. The happiness of the show must connect to the notion of a future of happiness without referring to an earlier time before the dictatorship as that could remind people of a period of uncertainty or hardship. Of course, Aristotle isn't thinking of the emotion of happiness as such, but flourishing, the well-lived life, eudaimonia, as a sort of living and faring well. However, the No campaign must appeal to experiences of joy, allegria, like a picnic in the countryside, dancing or horse riding, to evoke that kind of flourishing. The positive programs and ads could be seen as a kind of repression of the traumatic memories in their turn from a real past to the desire for an imagined future. But that interpretation isn't borne out in that there is a reference to that past. The optimistic note of the No programs can also be seen as creating a narrative whereby the past can be connected to the future and the individual linked to their community. So we also need to understand the complexity of the protagonist René and how he becomes drawn into the campaign to comprehend the link between trauma and resistance in No. I argue that the narrative should be interpreted as a transformative one where René's character and actions both prompt and track the significant elements of happiness as a form of resistance. In contrast, reviews of the film have referred to Renee as a sellout, apolitical, cynical, and lacking in scruple, neoliberal, as having political apathy, self-regarding, as being indifferent to democratic ideals, and so on. So other critics decry the focus on a single heroic individual as simplifying and distorting the campaign, and Irana Zero, a Latin American cultural studies scholar, thinks of René as passive and unconcerned with democracy, noting that he doesn't try to defend himself when one of the opposition coalition members accuses him of silencing what really happened. But could René's seeming apoliticism be itself a feature of traumatization, like the detached calm philosopher Jeffrey Bluestein describes as a consequence of subjection to atrocities? In fact, René is no stranger to trauma since his father was sent into exile when Pinochet took over Chile. Nevertheless, he's an outsider precisely because of that exile and his advertising profession seen as collusive with the regime and that may help explain his willingness to fo focus on a positive message rather than on showing representations of the trauma. He's approached by socialist leader Jose Poma. Urrutia for the campaign and is initially sceptical, like many other Chileans, arguing that the referendum will be completely fixed. They want René to give an external opinion since he doesn't want to direct the campaign, but he begins to forget, get involved and then agrees to run it. René conflicts with his boss, Lucho, uh, when he tells him that the Americans are with the no, while Lucho claims the Americans will remain with Pinochet and works for the Yes campaign. One aspect of trauma can be a reduced affect, first as a self-protection from a violent regime, and second as a self-protection from exposure to emotional pain. Blunted affect or emotional numbing and lack of expression of emotion, especially positive emotions, is known as a symptom of post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, in a review, Omar M. Mosafar observes 
that Renee speaks in whispers. He rarely smiles. Um, this is his ex, Veronica. So he clearly wants to get back with his former partner, Veronica, but when he sees her with another man, he says and does nothing. Only if we look at his eyes can we see, thanks to Bernard's superb acting, how much suffering he's enduring. And is that the level of solidarity with no, a fundamental refusal of the dictatorship and Pinochet that René does his work? Despite intimidation and an inducement to withdraw, an offer of partnership from his boss, Lucho, he continues with the campaign. René clearly changes as the campaign progresses. In contrast, Zero's claim that Lorraine and Pedro Pereno, the scriptwriter, insist that the campaign has no impact on him and has no transformative or educational impact on the ad man. However, while at the beginning René doesn't intervene to help Veronica when she's beaten at the police station, later we see him being drawn in to help her at the demonstration and is kicked in the stomach and thrown to the ground. Furthermore, he accepts the abuse painted in red on his window. It's translated as homeland peddling mar Marxist, um, being followed and threatened as a result of his work for the campaign. Renee's transformation is linked to a collective transformation that's expressed in the film's style. Zero analyzes the film as a simulacrum, where there's no concern about the distinction between the media images and reality expressed by Renee's setup of a group enjoying a picnic, including baguettes and saying it works. However, this interpretation seems not to take seriously enough the way the film draws attention to its artifice at certain points. As Lorraine casts real figures from the campaign with their younger versions in the documentary footage, such as Patricio Alwyn, Chilean president after Pinochet, playing an elderly politician. But around the actor's body returns to where it once was. It returns, returns, and that's the work of memory. It's beautiful. He sees his roles as doing some of the work of recovery from trauma and as helping others to avoid making the same mistakes. The presence of the individuals both evokes their place in the past and reminds viewers how things have changed. It's important to the film and to history that the campaign was a success with 54.7% of Chileans voting no. At the beginning, most people were afraid to vote and of a return to socialism. People were skeptical about whether the vote would be accepted, yet they had to support the vote so that it would be accepted. What is crucial to the success of the no campaign are the shifts to positivity and the future, and the shift from individual suffering to collective defiance, which the ads contribute to. Instead of looking at the trauma and the negative emotions as individual, the campaign focuses on the shared capacity for happiness referred to in another slogan, we are more. So nevertheless, the film's conclusion is ambiguous since Rene leaves the celebration for the plebiscite win with his son and commentators have remarked on his muted response taken as a sign of quietism. I argue that the ending, rather than depicting cynicism about democracy, depicts the ambiguity and ambivalence of political change. Any transition from a dictatorship to a democracy is bound to be multifaceted and have both positive and negative aspects. So the events of the transition are unlikely to support a one-sided interpretation. The Chilean transition is variously described as a beautiful, almost mystic moment of national euphoria, a unique time of people collaborating, or the beginning of the mediatization of Chilean politics. Seeing Renee skateboarding through a city street towards the end of the film gives an impression of joy, although Mozafra suggests it's a scene of loneliness. In the final scene, he's back at the advertising agent agency working on the soap opera, an ambivalent presentation on how some things will stay the same even after the switch to democracy. In contrast, it's also signs of hope beyond the winning of the plebiscite. Veronica and Renee are united in their care and concern for their son Simon, and to some extent become united in their desire for the no case to win. Renee's son in the film is the future, the generation that the promise of happiness is held out to. He's only eight and would have known nothing but the regime, as even a 15-year-old would. In no, Renee's youth and even childlikeness is stressed. 
as he goes skateboarding, playing with train sets and looking after and engaging with his son. Wells suggests he's petulant because of these activities and Mozafar that he is a soft-spoken kid with an empty life of toys and opulence. However, in the context of the trilogy, they also imply that in post dictatorship Chile, youth and the next generations will have a chance. This is my conclusion. So the highlighting of happiness in the film and the campaign is itself a form of resistance to oppression and the perpetrators of atrocities as it shifts our affects away from fear, from desire for material things and even from comfort for at the cost of democracy and the suffering of others. No also shows how happiness brings together a variety of different political actors in a refusal of dictatorship, a refusal to let the trauma continue. The transformation of Renee's character in the film as it becomes more engrossed in the campaign shows the importance of sharing in collective resistance. While the No campaign in the film and its success can't be imitated, um, as it depends on the specificity of Chile and the plebiscite, the temporal, affective, and pluralistic approach to resistance is one that can inspire us. So that's the end. Thank you. Thank you so much, Margaret.